Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for joining us again this week on the Fading Memories podcast. I'm your host, Jen. With me today is Dr. Katie Lee. She is a dentist, and we are going to be talking about the important connection between oral and brain health. So thanks for joining me today, Katie. Thank you for having me. This is a very important topic, so I'm happy to share my expertise. I think I've only discussed it one other time in over 300 plus episodes. Pretty sure that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we definitely need to talk about it again. And that one was less the connection between oral and brain health and more along the lines of how to help your older adult, specifically ones that might be having cognitive issues, to maintain their oral health, get their oral health. And there were some pretty funny stories in there too. <laughs> yeah, so that- I've, I've experienced some, some, I mean, they're, they're really sad when you, when you see them, right? But, you know, they, they are kind of funny. But unfortunately, as cognitive decline increases and they go further down that path, their oral hygiene gets worse, which as we'll learn here shortly, only exacerbates cognitive decline. So it's, it's kind of a, uh, unfortunate cycle that they get into. I think I was benefit, but I think it was beneficial. My mom had been with the same dentist for a really long time. So they were, they were with her as the disease progressed. Mm -hmm. So they were very realistic about, you know, what they couldn't, couldn't do during, you know, the annual visits or the biannual visits. Um, they needed to do x-rays once and that was a little bit of a challenge but it's like they they understood her enough to work with her so that was that was great because we'd had to go to a new dentist and like train them on how to deal with my mom yeah <laughs> might have just quit so why don't you give us your background first before we take off running on the topic. Sure, sure. So I'm a a general dentist. I'm located here in the uh, Denver, Colorado, or Denver area. Um, I've been practicing since 2010. And I've really focused my practice on oral systemic health, the connection between the mouth and the rest of the body. Um, I wrote a book called Saved by the Mouth, which is all about um, exactly what it sounds, how focusing by focusing on your oral health, you can really improve several systemic ailments, one of them being uh, brain health. So we'll talk about that today. Um, And then I'm in the middle of building a brand new state of the art clinic um, that's going to house um, everything that a patient would need from oral health to systemic health. So we're going to have, um, medical doctors, cardiologists, diabetologists, chiropractors, and then we're going to have al- alternative, uh, health modalities as well, such as acupuncturists, myofunctional therapists, things like that. Uh, we're also going to have a sleep apnea and airway clinic, and then a training and education center to help educate other providers around the country on these topics and then um, hopefully educate patients as well. So pretty excited about that project. Yeah, that sounds like a giant undertaking, but very it interesting. Is. <laughs> it's, um, you know, I had big ambitions when I started and um, now that I'm into the nitty gritty of it, I mean, it is like, you know, instead of just opening one practice, right, I'm really opening three different businesses all in one building. So it's it's fun. I will say that it's a lot of work, but it is fun. Yeah, that's that's that is a definite undertaking. So where would you like to start on the oral health um, continuum, basically? Why, why is it important? You know, we brush every day, twice a day, floss daily. Can yeah. we start there? Sure. So <laughs> I think that it's really important for people to first understand um, just how the mouth is connected to brain health. And one thing that we know, there's lots of evidence out there showing that the major cause of cognitive decline or Alzheimer's and dementia is going to be poor blood glucose control. Um, a lot of people call, you know, Alzheimer's dementia, diabetes of the brain. Um, but behind that, directly behind that is going to be uh, oral bacteria that actually don't stay in the mouth they will get into the bloodstream. And one of the places that they go, because the brain is so closely geographically uh, close to the mouth, right? One of the first places that bacteria in the mouth go is the brain. And if the blood brain barrier isn't fully intact, which most of ours are not because of things that we encounter in our life, 
um, the blood brain barrier will not be able to stop these bacteria from getting into the brain and causing inflammation. And that inflammation is what can lead to cognitive decline. So, uh, we always say the number one cause of Alzheimer's dementia is poor blood glucose control. And then number two is going to be this oral bacteria and inflammation from oral sources. So really important for people to understand that. So my mom's diet of wonder bread, potatoes, red meat, two liters of diet Coke and copious amounts of candy was probably a bad choice. Probably a bad choice. You know, and I, I grew up in the Midwest and I remember eating wonder bread with margarine and sugar on it as like the side dish for my dinner. You know, we'd have fruit cocktail also, right. Um, bologna, the bologna that was like gray Brown with like the little fake cheese in it, American, um, cheese slices. Like I grew up on all that stuff too, uh, which makes me really nervous these days, but yeah, diet plays a big part of that because we know that if we're eating processed foods, that's just wreaking havoc on our insides and causing a lot of inflammation inside our arteries, um, processed food and sugary foods, such as, you know, candy and things like that, um, lead to diabetes, which the problem with diabetes or any kind of vascular inflammation is when you have inflammation inside your blood vessels, those blood vessels aren't as open as they typically would be. And so you're getting restricted blood flow and restricted oxygen to the brain. And when that happens, obviously the neurons and our brain cells can't survive. So they start to break down. So that's kind of how, how diabetes really affects the brain. I think my parents' diet stemmed from, well, my dad was a terrible eater, but he was from Iowa. I grew up in the Midwest. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he would have been super happy. I know like regular listeners probably like, oh, they could probably tell you exactly what I'm about to say. Fried hamburger patty, mashed potatoes, and either corn or peas every night for dinner, which makes me cringe because one, that's not that tasty a meal, but two, I like variety and you're making me feel really good that I chose a nice um, homemade chicken salad. And by salad, I mean, it was on like the broccoli slaw stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Yeah. I have very vivid memories of my grandmother would take out her insulin shot and give herself an insulin shot right before she would eat meals with us. Um, which obviously that's not good. And, you know, as you're eating all of this processed food and, and sugar, not only is it bad for your body, but we also know it breaks down your teeth. And so it can lead to, you know, things like gum disease and cavities and cavities lead to abscesses. So both gum disease, the bacteria that I was talking about earlier from the mouth that gets into the brain, that's actually caused by gum disease. And so we know that patients that have diabetes oftentimes also have gum disease. They go hand in hand. Um, And then they also will have a lot of cavities that lead to dental abscesses. And that's not good for the brain either. My dad was diabetic, but I don't think he had a lot of a lot of oral health issues, but now I'm questioning. No, he, they went to the dentist together. So I think he, he did good on that front, but yeah, my mom, my dad's side of the family, we all had very hard, crooked teeth. My mom's side of the family, very straight, but like chalk. I, I cannot, yeah, I cannot tell you how many, how many teeth my mom cracked with, you know, sugar daddies, yep. other yep. sticky candy. <laughs> Yeah. And, and if you have soft teeth, you know, and you are eating those sugary things, the teeth will actually get hollowed out, um, from the tooth decay. And so a tooth can appear healthy on the outside just by looking at it, but the whole inside will be eaten away by the tooth decay. And then you bite down on something and then that's how the teeth break. Um, and then the other thing about, about gum disease is, you know, in the past, I would say the dental profession has not been all that great at diagnosing and treating gum disease. Um, Mm. it's, it's been very subjective and very up to the treating dentist's discretion on whether or not they wanted to diagnose gum disease and treat patients for it. And so I know a lot of, you know, um, patients that had been seeing a dentist for years and years. And I'm not saying this was the case with where your dad went, but I would have a lot of patients come into my practice and they'd say, you know, I've I've had the same dentist for 30 years. They just retired. You know, I'm here today to, to continue care with you. And I would take a look at their gums. I would perform a saliva test to see if they actually had gum disease, bacteria or um, a gum infection. And their um, numbers would be through the roof and they'd have a massive infection, but yet no one had ever tested for it or caught it before. So oftentimes I was the first person letting them know that they, that they do have pretty advanced gum disease. So that's pretty unfortunate. 
Um, but we do have lots of diagnostics now that we can use in dentistry, much like in the medical profession, right? So if you go to your doctor and he wants to test you for diabetes, he'll prick your finger or he'll do a blood test to measure your A1C. Um, we now have tests like that in dentistry that can actually tell us if a patient has gum disease or a gum infection, which is awesome. I had not known about that. And I just was recently at my dentist. They're new because we relocated. Is there something those of us caregivers should be asking so that we are protecting our own oral slash brain health? Because, yeah. I, got, you know, I got my follow up appointment in like, I think, three months. So that's a really great question. So the biggest thing that I would say, so saliva testing, even though it is um, available and, and a lot of dentists use it, I would say it's definitely not mainstream yet. Um, that's why I'm on the mission, why I wrote the book about it um, and trying to educate all these people to get saliva testing. Cause I just, I really believe in how important, how important it is for our health. I think the biggest thing is when you go see your dentist, make sure they're doing a full gum exam on you. So what does that mean? That means, um, you know, the sharp pointy probe that they go around and measure your gums that should be done at every single cleaning that you go into, regardless if you're healthy or not. Um, you know, when I was trained back in 2010, we would only do it once a year on healthy patients. And then we would do it every three months, um, on patients that had gum disease. But what we know now is that health can change in as little as 90 days. So if I presented as a healthy patient a year ago, or let's say, you know, six months ago, I came in and I was healthy and now I'm back, I could have, um, contracted bacteria in that time and started to have gum disease. And if the dentist doesn't go in or the hygienist doesn't go in and do the gum measurements, it's not going to get caught. And then by the time they do it again, six months later, I could be in full-blown gum disease. So always make sure they do those measurements. Um, but if there's any question that a patient has in terms of, you know, I have diabetes or I have heart disease, or maybe it runs in my family, um, maybe Alzheimer's dementia runs in my family, um, or, you know, maybe they do have gum disease. I would definitely recommend them to ask for a saliva test to screen for this stuff. Um, and if their dentist doesn't do it, there's certainly some, you know, remote dentist, telehealth dentists that will do it for you. Um, that is something that I do as well, because it's not that common. People can contact me and I can give them a saliva test to figure out if there's something going on in their mouth. Awesome. Well, my dentist did do the measurements. Great. So that's, that's awesome. Good. So now I got to I got to shake the rust off the brain cells to see to remember I'm sure they I know the chart they have you fill out has about family history so I yeah. had to have basically put the diabetes on my dad's side of the family and the cognitive impairment on my mom's side of the family my my medical history is really exciting same uh, so I I almost need like a book every time I go in to give to people just from from my family's medical history but that is so important to write down and that's something else I always tell people to do is make sure you go to a provider that spends quite a bit of time with you on your medical history and your families cuz most diseases take about 10 years of of inflammation, you know, or impairment before you actually qualify or meet the threshold levels to get a diagnosis. So, you know, a lot of times I'll have people in their mid twenties come see me and I'll see some, you know, some pretty severe warning signs in their mouth that something is going on, but, you know, systemic health wise, they're totally healthy, no high blood pressure, no diabetes, no arthritis, no dementia, um, so I always ask about their family because if their family has these diseases, then I know, Hey, this patient's at high risk for also contracting me. So it's really important to provide that information to your, to your provider. That's excellent to know. So I'm really glad we shared that. And I'm really glad my dentist is yeah. on the right track. Yeah. The last you know, one I, was too. I get that from patients a lot. They'll say, you know, you're my dentist. Why do you need to know all this stuff? Um, and that just shows how little knowledge there is out there about how much the mouth affects the rest of the body. Uh, but it is really important for us to know all of that information. That makes sense because you don't really, unless you've read about it, which I have or heard about it, you don't, you don't really put the two together, which is why mm -hmm. we're talking about it today. Yeah. So yeah, the mouth, oral health is connected to brain health, heart health, um, diabetes health, uh, arthritis, gut health, cancer. <laughs> COPD and lung health. Um, I think I hit all the major fertility is a big one. That's a really big one is fertility health. So yeah, if basically every system in the body is going to be connected to your, to your mouth. 
That's interesting. It's connected to fertility as well. I mean, I'm not surprised because it's connected to everything, but that one, that one, that one made me think for a second. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. And it's all about the bacteria in the mouth. So there's certain pathogens in the mouth that when they get in through the gum tissue, when the gum tissue starts to break down from inflammation, it gets into the body, it circulates, and it will uh, go to these distant organ systems. And we know that that bacteria is not supposed to be there. So when the bacteria gets there, for example, infertility, it can impede ovulation, um, embryo implantation, it can cause miscarriage and stillbirths. Um, in men, it causes erectile dysfunction, it changes their sperm count and motility. So, oh yeah, it causes all kinds of issues. In the gut, it leads to colon cancer. Certain bacteria will lead to colon cancer. So it's it's a pretty big deal. Yowzas. So, <laughs> yeah, I think we've established that it's um, highly important and yes. why. Yes. Um, I had forgotten that the blood-brain barrier isn't always like a sealed off tomb for lack of a better term. Yeah. So good reminder. So yeah. if you're caring for somebody in maybe the moderate to advanced stages of dementia, Alzheimer's, do you have, I mean, this is like, you don't want to come at them with a toothbrush, just like you wouldn't with a toddler. Do you have any suggestions on how to help them maintain their, oral health as their, you know, their disease progresses? Yeah, that's, that's such a good question because, um, you know, because we know, and the research is there that oral health affects brain health, unfortunately, as their cognitive impair impairment, as they go, go further and further along and they get more impaired, their oral hygiene is going to become more and more impaired. So therefore there's more bacteria getting into the brain, right? So it's just kind of this unfortunate feedback loop that we don't want to be in. So what can we do to help those patients? Um, I think the biggest thing, you know, which is uh, for a lot of people, it's going to be too late at this point, but the biggest thing is going to be prevention, right? We want to kind of prevent any issues that we can ahead of time. So if you have a family member that's showing mild cognitive impairment now, even if you're just kind of questioning it, you know, is, is mom starting to forget stuff or is there something going on? I'd really encourage to get them into a dentist, get a saliva test, figure out if they have these specific bacteria that are causing uh, cognitive issues and maybe communicate with that provider of, Hey, I think something's going on. We need to get in and try and treat a lot of these oral conditions as soon as possible, because we know that down the road is going to be even harder. Um, I always recommend for cognitive impairment patients and anyone in general, they should be going to see their dentist at minimum every three months for cleaning. So even if you're healthy um, or if you have gum disease, whatever it is, three month cleaning should be the norm for everyone, which I know is not commonplace, but the whole idea here is to always keep the bacteria load in your mouth as low as possible, because that will lower the, uh, inflammation burden on the rest of the body. Um, the other thing is, is there's, there's lots of products that are out on the market that can help, um, kill the bacteria that cause tooth decay. It can also help balance the, the microbiome or the bacteria that's in the mouth, um, because brushing and flossing is not always going to be as ideal on those patients. So if you talk to your provider, there's, there's lots of over the counter stuff that they can do mints, uh, mouth washes, things like that, that can keep the bacteria low level or low. The other big thing is, um, making sure that patients keep their teeth. So there's so much research out there showing that the more teeth that you lose and you don't replace them it takes years off of the life expectancy and it also exacerbates cognitive decline. So the key is, and that what everyone should strive for is to have 10 pairs of teeth. So when I say a pair, I mean a tooth on top and a tooth on bottom because they have to meet to chew our food. Um, being able to chew our food, you know, allows us to still eat really healthy foods like, you know, fresh veggies and things like that. When we lose our teeth, um, you know, we're more likely to start eating all those processed foods like Wonder Bread and pasta and stuff like that, which is only going to spike our blood sugar, which again, is only going to make our cognitive uh, impairment even worse. So really encourage uh, those family members that you're working with to keep their teeth. A lot of times, and when I first started practicing, I'd have patients come in and, and they'd say, you know, mom or dad is, is, was just diagnosed with dementia, Alzheimer's, um, their teeth were not in great shape. So they'd say, let's take out all of their teeth and give them dentures. 
or given partials, I can't tell you how many times I would see a very robust individual coming into my office. And then we edentulated them. We took out all their teeth and gave them dentures and they were in the grave very quickly thereafter. Um, because mm, once you crazy. take out a person's teeth, they have nothing left to chew with or communicate and their ability to wear a denture in, in an Alzheimer's or, or a patient with dementia is pretty much non-existent. They can't, I've had patients come in and the caregivers will say their dentures don't fit. Well, that the patient would have their top denture on the bottom and the bottom denture on top. And Ooh, we know that's... when they're in and I'm dead serious. This happened all the time. Or um, they'll be in care facilities, long-term care facilities, and they'll bring them in and they'll say, you know, so my my parent has a foul odor, odor coming out of their mouth and I'll look in their mouth and their denture will be basically grown in to their tissues and covered in fungus and thrush. And I'm we so know glad thrush, I already had lunch. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, I know. I know. I, you know, as a dentist, I'm so used to talking about this stuff. Right. But I sometimes forget that it's not all that appetizing to other people. Um, but we know that thrush, you know, definitely causes uh, little fig formations or glial granulomas in the brain that lead to Alzheimer's and dementia. So the best thing that you can do for your um, family member is to prevent them from losing their teeth. That's a good point because I know my mom was in memory care and she had her teeth, what what there was of them. Um, but, you know, they had issues with, you know, accidental denture swapping. I thought yeah. you were going to tell me that they had the that the they came in and something was wrong is because they had the neighbor's dentures, which yeah. is probably also something you've experienced. But oh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, um, I've, I've definitely had that happen too. And, and nowadays we print the, the name um, on the dentures for the patient. So that way that doesn't happen, hopefully. But yeah, try and, you know, and people, people tend to think like, oh, you know, I have a family member with dementia. I'm, I'm no longer going to invest in their oral health. That's like the exact opposite of what you want to do. You almost want to put more time and money into their oral health because studies show time and time again, the better they can uh, healthier they can keep their teeth, the longer they can keep their natural teeth, or if they do need an extraction, replacing that tooth with something permanent will um, definitely delay cognitive decline and increase their quality of life. And yeah, when you get to a certain point, it gets challenging. Like I, I remember one of the last times I took my mom to her dentist, you know, it's like literally three or four minutes in the car and she's like a little kid. Where are we going? Yeah. Are we, you know, it's like For the, sure. this one particular time, she thought I was her best friend. So I told her that I was taking her to the dentist and she was adamant that that wasn't my responsibility. Okay, well, yeah, for your friend it isn't, but your daughter, <laughs> I think it is. Yeah. And she wanted to make sure that my my dad, Chuck, was paying for me to do this. I was just like, this whole conversation is painful. And yeah. like I mentioned before, her dentist had been with her through the progression of her disease. So they 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 understood her. Whereas yep. if we had had to change dentists, it's very difficult unless you've experienced your own personal journey with some form of dementia. You know, yeah. it's like you, you get into your routine. It's like, well, why can't we just do these X, X rays or why can't they just brush their teeth right? Or why can't the caregivers sure. brush her teeth for her? Because we did get to that point. Her teeth weren't quite as maintained as they would have liked to have seen. And they were like, you know, we, we kind of tried to strategize a little bit, but, you know, I've been to newer providers. This would be on the health side, the medical side. I mean, they're both medical, but, you know, <laughs> I think you're following yeah. on the doctor's side. There we go. Oh, it's still the wrong term. <laughs> no, I get it. And yeah, I understand. They, yeah, they just, they just seemed clueless. So it's yeah. one of my goals in life is to help educate, like what you're doing is educate healthcare providers across the board on how to care for somebody yeah. with a cognitive disease, because as I'm sure you know, it is an entirely different process than when I go to the dentist and they tell me we need to do X, Y, Z. I understand. I make the appointment. I follow through. Yep. When yep. Doesn't work. Didn't work that way for my mom. So and was... I, I think when they get to that advanced stage, the best thing that you can do for them is to make them not make, but take them to the dentist in the morning 
usually behavior is better in the morning. So as soon as they get up, you know, first thing you do is, is get them into the dentist. A lot of times dentists will make accommodations for those patients and they'll not book anybody else at that time. So that way there's not, you know, all these distractions and other things for that, for that patient. Um, it's always really good to make sure that the patient is in a room that's really comfortable. So we would have like a tempur chair pad that we would put down on the chair, a pillow, a blanket, you know, we would try and make them feel as, as cozy and as at home as possible. Um, and then we would just try and do the best that we could to get in there and clean their teeth. You know, at that point, sometimes we can't clean anymore. Right. But at that point, sometimes what we're doing is we're just trying to administer palliative care, which is we're taking, you know, a big three dimensional x-ray and from that, just trying to figure out, are there broken teeth? Are there abscesses? And if so, you know, we would use um, anesthesia. We'd put the patient to sleep in order to get a lot of that care done. So there are still ways that, you know, we can get in there and help those patients. There's also at home uh, dental services that patient that you can hire um, that, you know, clinicians will come to your home and, and clean the patient's teeth or render as much care as possible there. So then you don't even have to take them out of their house. That's, I think, part of the topic that we talked about. It's been like three, four years, been a long time. I will link the other dental episode in the show notes so you guys can catch up on that one. But yeah, we weren't talking about the connection between the oral health and brain health. We were just talking about how to how to help your loved one with dementia maintain their oral health. So similar, yeah. but not quite the same. And like I said, she had some hysterical stories. Yeah. Well, and it, and if you're, if your loved one does have dentures or a partial or something and they are wearing them, it's so important. And I'm sure that they talked about this in that episode too, but it's so important to take those out at night. If, if the patient is able to wear them, you must take them out at night because at night is, or number one, that you have to clean the prosthetic. So the, the denture is very porous and fungus loves to live on dentures. And if you don't take it out and clean that off, the fungus will, will grow on the inside of the denture and in the patient's mouth. And again, fungus exacerbates dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, and the tissues need to breathe. So oftentimes I'll have elderly patients come in and I take their denture out and their tissue is very red, sometimes even bleeding um, because they have so much infection uh, from their dentures. So make sure you take the dentures out at night. Don't let them sleep with them and, and clean them because that'll, that'll help keep the patient healthy as well. So when it, we get to the advanced stages of Alzheimer's and probably other dementias as well, they lose the ability to like chew. It's their brain, not their teeth. Yep. And so you yep. have to put them on at least softened foods yeah is there um is there a way of doing that that doesn't exasperate any kind of oral health issues like if they're healthy but now you know their brain has it's the disease has progressed the uh, ah, one particular person i'm thinking of the chewing was so yeah. exhausting that yeah. they would fall asleep like in the middle of a meal with food in their mouth, which yeah. obviously is not ideal. So their, their care partner put them on, it's not, they're not pureed foods, but it's like cooked really, really soft. So probably yep. similar to baby food. So what would you yeah. suggest people do when they get to that stage? Yeah. So the biggest thing is you just want to try and eliminate as much sugar or processed foods like as possible, which we should all be doing from our diet. Um, but, you know, throwing a bunch of veggies in a crock pot, right. And getting them as soft as possible so that they really don't have to chew them a lot. Or, you know, once you put them in the crock pot, throw them in a blender and puree them for the patient. So they, it's, they're kind of eating it like a soup at that point. So veggie soups are great. Um, and you can even put them in, um, you can buy these pouches on Amazon. They're just silicone food pouches and you can puree the food, put it in the pouch. And then the patient literally can just squeeze it or you can do it for them um, to get the food in there. But you still really want to ensure that they're getting all of the macronutrients that they need. So focusing on fruits, focusing on vegetables, and then trying to get them some sort of protein, you know, pureeing um, meat is not always that appetizing, although they do make pureed meat baby foods. Um, I use that for my son, but um, they could do things like salmon, right? Um, salmon, you can literally just uh, pick at it with your fork and it kind of shreds. 
um, crock pot chicken that you can shred up would be really great for them to eat. Cottage cheese is a, is a wonderful protein food. Um, you can throw some, some flax or some pea protein or something like that in their little, uh, pouch. So there's, but really make sure that they're not protein deficient. Cause in my experience and, and probably yours too, you had a, a, a mom, uh, with Alzheimer's, they protein is probably the hardest thing for them to consume because chewing meat is really hard. Um, but they absolutely cannot be protein deficient. Our whole body runs on protein. So of, of all the things to be deficient in protein is not the one you want to choose. So make sure they're still getting protein. And if it gets difficult, like the thought of pureed red meat is just yuck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is surprising. Like peas, you mentioned pea powder. Yeah. Um, Peas protein. actually have, I think, more protein than an egg. They have more protein than something else. Yeah. My I, brain I thinks... I vegetarian-based. I do meat every now and then. Um, me too. But I, I love pea protein. I put pea protein in everything. Chia seeds are fantastic. Chia seeds are like a, a superpower food. Um, they're, they're t they look like salt. So you, you literally can just put them in a salt shaker and just put them on everything, salads, everything. Um, but you could add some chia seeds to, to their puree. Chia seeds are full of fiber and they're full of protein. Um, so that's something that's really good that you can add in there. Yeah, I throw those on my yogurt bowls. Yeah, they're phenomenal. And lentils, you can cook lentils really soft and lentils yep. are really good protein. Now I'm getting hungry again. I just yeah, had I know, me too. I haven't had lunch yet. And I'm like trying to think like, what do I have here to eat when we're done? Oh, I had to open the fridge and go. So I had a meeting that went long before this. I'm like, okay, I only have time for this prepared stuff that I've already made. Yeah. Um, and like I said, it was mostly, you know, like shredded broccoli and cabbage and carrots oh, perfect. and perfect. Um, chicken. I don't eat perfect. much meat that's other than chicken. Yeah. That's the perfect. older I get. Yeah. The older I get, the less I want meat. It's very weird. Yeah. But beneficial. Lost well, weight. I'm, I'm glad you brought up nutrition because as, as the cognitive decline gets worse, nutrition becomes harder and harder. And we know mm -hmm. that it, malnourishment is only going to exacerbate the issue, right? So you do have to be creative in, in how you're going to nourish it. Um, and the, the mouth obviously is what starts our digestion. So the mouth is connected to our gut health. You know, there's a lot of um, buzz out there about the gut microbiome and our gut health. But what people don't understand is, you know, how did that bacteria even get into our gut first? Right. And it all That's, comes in through our mouth. So we have to point. make sure that the oral microbiome is healthy. Otherwise you're not going to have a healthy gut microbiome. And so if you're not keeping your, your loved ones nourished, and if you're not maintaining their oral health to, you're not going to be able to maintain their gut health either. Just all starts from the top and works its way down, huh? <laughs> no, it really does. People don't understand uh, understand it. So I'm on a mission here. The other big thing is, um, have you ever talked with anyone or heard anything about sleep apnea and, and what it does to brain health? Yeah, there's. I talked to researchers last year, last summer, so summer 2023, and they were one of the like side notes to the research that they were doing was they were frustrated that the clinical trials for the drugs that we now have for treating early stage dementias did not include a sleep study. And that was really interesting. And just kind of as a highlight to that, I have a friend who had high blood pressure. Like everything else about him was really healthy, but he had high blood pressure. And they... They did not connect that to his sleep apnea, but as soon as he went on the CPAP machine, his blood oh, pressure yeah. regulated. Yep. And so, he, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, and it was just like, you know, you, you don't really connect the two. Mm -hmm. And I like to tell that story just because it's a really quick snapshot of why it's important. But yeah, if you're not sleeping well and you're not, you know, you stop breathing multiple times a night, that definitely affects your brain. <laughs> Totally. So, and this is why I'm putting a sleep clinic in my facility because, you know, sleep apnea is kind of this weird um, thing that some people are, you know, know that they have sleep apnea. It's obvious for them, but as much as 75 to 80% of all sleep apnea cases are undiagnosed. That's what's like scary for me because when you have sleep apnea, essentially what's happening is you stop breathing during the night. To qualify for sleep apnea, you have to stop breathing for 10 seconds or more, more than five times an hour in order to qualify mm. for sleep apnea. I mean, to think that like 
you're not breathing for 50 seconds every hour while you're sleeping. I mean, that's like really scary. And when you're not oxygenating your blood because you're not breathing, it's damaging your brain cells, kill, killing your brain cells. And it puts immense pressure on your heart. That's why all these people have strokes and heart attacks in the middle of the night and they die is because the, they stop breathing. Um, and so I'm not surprised that your, your friend's blood pressure regulated once he got that treated and sleep ap- untreated sleep apnea is fatal. It's just a matter of time. And so one thing that I always encourage people to do is I always recommend every patient of mine to get a sleep study because it's not always the typical, you know, overweight, obese, short, you know, short neck person that has apnea. Oftentimes it's postmenopausal women that are really thin because after menopause, we lose our bones and our bones start to shrink. When our bones start to shrink, the musculature and tendons and everything that are attached to the bones now start to sag. So our airway that used to be able to maintain itself holding open when we're sleeping now collapses at night. So I see a lot of thin postmenopausal women with apnea actually. Um, but one thing to, that you can do to ensure that your brain stays healthy is to get a sleep test to at least rule it out. And just because you had a sleep test five years ago and we're fine, doesn't mean you're fine today. Um, and where your dentist can really come in with this is there are so many signs in the mouth of someone having sleep apnea. So if someone comes in and they say, I grind my teeth at night, first thing I do is give them a sleep test. If they stick their tongue out and they have little ridges on the side of their tongue, first thing I do is give them a sleep test. If they suffer from acid reflux, sleep test. If I tell them to open their mouth and say, ah, oh, and I can't see the back of their throat, sleep test. I mean, there's so many things that I, you know, that I'm not even talking about that I would recommend a sleep study for, but if someone has diabetes, 85% of diabetics also have sleep apnea. That's a yeah, really, my dad had it yeah. really badly. Totally. It also runs in families because our, our genes determine, you know, our bone structure. Um, and then if someone's on two or more blood pressure medications, um, it's pretty much a given they have apnea. So, uh, if you want to prevent cognitive decline, go get a sleep test. <laughs> That's very, something very easy you can do. And okay. the treatment for apnea isn't always a CPAP. So a lot of people will say, you know, I don't, I, don't, I just don't want to have to wear a CPAP. So I'm not going to get tested. Well, your dentist can make you a mouth appliance that can hold your lower jaw forward and your airway open at night. So you don't have to wear a CPAP, um, which is yeah, really nice. Sure and there's that- other treatments as well. I don't think. I don't think I would do well with one of those masks on my face, but yeah, a lot of people say that, you know, it's kind of like being in a wind tunnel, right? First off, you're claustrophobic. You have this thing on your face. You can't really roll around and sleep comfortably. And then you have all this air blowing into your mouth, which by the way, dries out your mouth and changes your oral microbiome, which is not great. (laughs) Um, So an oral appliance is is, uh, a good option for a lot of patients. So would it be beneficial when I go back to my dentist for the next cleaning to ask them if they see any signs that might indicate, okay, I'm I'm going to add that to a reminder for that appointment. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Always check. You know, and if, if anyone listening, if you've never had a sleep test, just go get a sleep test. There's lots of, and now you don't even have to go into the hospital. Um, many times a dentist or your physician will work with a company that will send you a sleep test that you can do at home. Just a little band you put around your, your rib cage. There's a little pulse ox you wear on your finger and nasal cannula and all the information gets recorded at night and then gets uploaded to the cloud. And then a doc can read it from remotely and give you a diagnosis that way. So you don't have to go in and, and have someone stare at you all night anymore. <laughs> Which Actually, is so that's uncomfortable. A- like, how would you ever be able to sleep through the night, right? If someone's like staring at you, watching you sleep. Well, and if you're not in your normal environment, it's, totally. you know, totally. like I don't sleep as good in a hotel and it's not reflective of the Absolutely. comfort of their mattresses. It's just, I don't know. I think you're just kind of aware you're not in your normal environment. So like your, you know, biological yeah. brain is kind of listening for like, Yep. Or you know, the Huns coming for me or whatever. Yeah. And it, that's not the same, same sleep, right? As what, so you could go in and do the sleep study in a hospital, but sleep lighter than you normally would and not get into sleep, uh, a deep, deep enough sleep where you would have sleep apnea versus if you're at home and you're totally knocked out. I mean, you're probably going to have more apneic events at home. So that's why they started doing that. But apnea and airway health is so important for brain health. Well, it's nice to know that the dentist can can give you an appliance to help with that for people who like myself are 99% certain that that mask would not stay on. Absolutely. It just looks uncomfortable. And I know they yeah. have smaller ones and all that stuff, but um, I don't, is there any, 
signs we should watch for for sleep apnea? Yeah. So um, I so many. So grinding your teeth. If you know that you grind your teeth, that's a warning sign. Oftentimes people who have crowding, so um, crisscross teeth, crooked teeth often have airway issues. Um, if you have bags under your eyes, usually airway. If you wake up and you have a concentrated headache, like right in the center of your, um, right in the center of your forehead in the morning that goes away after about 30 minutes, usually airway acid reflux, usually airway, um, uh, big masseter muscles. So the muscles on the side of your face, when you look at some people, you'll see that they have like these big jowls or it almost looks like they have baseballs here. <laughs> uh, and oftentimes they'll have big temp temporalis muscles here too. And so when they chew or talk, you see them like really bulge. Those pa patients usually have airway. Um, and then again, diabetic and hypertensive patients as well. Okay. So the only box there I checked is that I used to have super severe acid reflux and it does act up every so often, but it's not constant. Ongoing. Yeah. So. yeah. So that's probably a good sign then. So I don't check any of those boxes. That's good. But good. I'm still going to ask the dentist to still check. Still do it anyway. Yeah. Still Just, do it anyway. Best case scenario, you don't have apnea. Awesome. Right? Worst case I mean, scenario, you have it. Now we treat it. Yeah, and he's already in there. So he might as well look for it. May as well look, <laughs> right? Yeah. That is the first time I've ever heard that a dentist can actually look for signs of apnea. Yeah. And, I, well, and you mentioned and some that I've never heard of either. The other thing is if, if you open your mouth and stick your tongue out and look in the mirror, if you can't see the hangy ball or the uvula, if you can't see all the way down underneath of it into your throat, probably have airway issues. Now so, everybody's going to run into the mirror. I know. They're gonna, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if you open and stick your tongue out and you can't see past the end of your uvula, it's probably airway. That's really yeah, interesting. Yeah, go see your dentist, have them check. They can always refer you for a sleep study. And then if you have it, we, and the thing is it's treatable. That's what's so nice. You know, so many things, so many diseases we have are not treatable. This is, and it can, you know, prevent a lot of issues, heart attack, stroke, and, and Alzheimer's and dementia. And it's not like the treatment is, you know, invasive or, you know, difficult. Right. And you'll probably feel better because you'll wake up with more oh energy. My. Oh my gosh. People tell me like, Cause we can have you take, you know, a, a sleep survey where we ask you how tired you are. Do you fall asleep while you're driving? You know, all these things people come in and they say, oh my gosh, I have so much energy. Like I don't need to drink coffee anymore. Like I'm running around like the energizer bunny. And all we did was <laughs> fix their sleep. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, this and has just been because you feel like you sleep, you know, I'll hear people say, oh, I sleep like a trucker. Like I'm totally knocked out. I don't snore. That definitely does is not indicative of airway health. Whether or not you snore doesn't mean you have apnea. Typically people think like, you know, um, if you have apnea, you're, you're snoring really loud. Um, that's not always the case. Then people with apnea don't snore at all. I know I had, I did an episode with a gal on um, FTD awareness and she talks okay. in that episode on, she had sleep apnea and it didn't present in the like mm -hmm. quote normal way that we are associated with. So, well, and it's funny you, you mentioned that because women are, you know, we say normal and normal in healthcare typically men means how men present, but women have a completely different set of symptoms, just like heart attacks, right? Like a, a heart attack signs in a woman is completely different than men in women. It's usually acid reflex, uh, chest pressure, actually from heartburn, um, postmenopausal thinner, no snoring, um, things like that. A couple other signs too, to look for is, you know, if you wake up frequently and you know, you're awake, that's probably airway. Um, if you have to get up to pee several times in the middle of the night, that's probably airway. Um, and if, when you get up in the morning, if it looks like a tornado went off in your bed, that's probably airway. <laughs> yeah. I like that last one. I, I it's a true. Cause, cause you're not breathing. So you're really tossing and turning all night. Um, cause you're choking versus that person who just like sleeps like a little angel baby, right. That doesn't move. <laughs> like they're usually fine. That's really interesting. Yeah. Well, this has been super helpful and super informative. Is there any last uh, bit of advice you want to leave the listeners before I, I let you go have lunch? Because you're an hour later than I me. Know, so I know. You must be starving. I think the biggest thing is, um, you know, get a saliva test. You don't know what's in your mouth unless you test. So test, don't guess. So find someone to do a saliva test. You can contact me if you need. Um, make sure you get your teeth cleaned and your gums checked every three months. And I'd say get an airway test, get a, a sleep test. 
just to make sure that you can keep your brain healthy. So caregivers, when you take your loved one to the dentist and you're yeah. going along with them for your, your treatments, your cleanings, ask them if they're seeing signs of sleep apnea because Lord knows we need to keep ourselves healthy even more so because we're caring for somebody with Definitely. these dev devastating diseases. And it does get challenging as a caregiver to basically maintain two whole lives. So. For sure, for sure. This one sounds like a pretty easy one for the typical caregiver to do. So, yeah, for sure. And it, and it has a big impact. Well, like I said, I'm putting a note on the calendar appointment for my dentist right. so, to ask for that. And that way I won't forget because, Great. you know, in a couple months I'll forget or I'll be there and I'll be like, there's something I was going to ask you. Yeah, and I know that there was something else I was supposed to do. I was going to be driving away going, oh, that's what it was. Yeah. So, yes, prevent that. Make a note on the calendar and that'll be great. So this has been so helpful. Man, I wish we had done this sooner because this is such excellent information that we all need to know. But especially those of us that are caregiving for somebody with some form of dementia. And um, I will put all your contact information in the web and the show notes like your website. Great. OK, my brain is fine. <laughs> It's just like, I'm, I'm jumping ahead too far. I'm getting ahead of my tongue. Um, I want I just want to thank you for reaching out and providing this information for the listeners. Sure. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.